Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A theologian once said that we should go to Holy Communion like we go to the day of our death. And we should go to the day of our death like we go to Holy Communion. Thinking about both in this way might change the way that we go towards each. Philip Nicolai had much to think about regarding death. A pastor in the town of Una, Germany, his town was struck by the bubonic plague. In the span of a year, over 1,300 people of the town died, more than half of the town's people that lived there. Looking outside the parsonage window at St. Catherine's Church, Pastor Nikolai could see the graveyard. One day alone, there were 30 people to be buried. These people were his parishioners, clerks who previously ran about the town scurrying on their errands, shopkeepers and merchants who had plied their trades, people like the shoemaker, the butcher's wife, and the child of the soap and candlestick maker. What happens when the grave digger dies? Who buries him? What happens when there's no lamp lit in the morning at the local bakery? What happens when the church bell ringer gets sick and the bells lay silent all around? One of the pastors in town preached a sermon series on how to prepare for death, a very fitting topic, of course. And you would expect a sense of dejection from all that death. But Pastor Nikolai endeavored each day to study the scriptures, to renew his quest therein, and to see what God said about this topic. He wrote a spiritual journey, dedicated his meditations to the people of his town and to the members of his congregation, and entitled the book with this title, A Mirror of the Joys of everlasting life. In this book, he spoke about the glory experienced by the souls now in paradise. He wrote it to the sufferers left behind. He penned two hymns, both the music and the text. They became known as the greatest two hymns in the German Lutheran tradition, called the King and the Queen of the German Chorales. They are sung in churches around the world to this day. But the occasion for their writing is often not known by those who take up their words on their lips. Understanding their context helps us sing them better. The first hymn we sang today was one of the ones Pastor Nikolai wrote. The second of them we will sing as the first song for Holy Communion. Both are full of joy as we speak about Jesus' return for us who are left here. The bridegroom is coming. He's coming back to get us. Those here are told to awake from their slumber. Turn from your drowsiness that would make you sleep through the important call to awake. Preparation is needed. The joy of these hymns is astounding when you consider that outside of his parsonage door as he was writing with his pen, the shovels were scratching the dirt, preparing another body for burial. But for the Christian, for the one who reads the scriptures and considers them, death is merely the moment where we meet our maker. Death surrounds us too in our lives, but it is in our hearts. We see it in how we have failed each other this week. We have demonstrated a self-centered love. We have only loved ourselves and not had a love for one another. Harsh words have been said, or maybe just a lack of love has been shown, starving others of love with the cold winter of the selfishness of our own hearts. 
We see death in our world. The tragic consequence of the problem of sin was seen this week as we have been a people whose emotions have been tied to a judicial verdict. What a world we live in where our hearts rise and fall by the judgments of a human court. We see death in the funerals that we have gone to. People we know have died of COVID or are now diagnosed. They wait silently in hospital beds or homes with questions that busy their hearts. Will this pass? Am I next? Will I die alone? Do the doctors really care? Is this all a farce? Earthly questions weigh heavier than the eternal ones. But what has this death produced in us, all around us? Has it driven us, like Pastor Nikolai, to the scriptures and to the contemplation of the mirror and joys of eternal life? Has it awakened in us a longing for our Maker? Or instead, have we involved our hearts in earthly concerns? We grow upset at the world. The world must change. Our leaders must change. People must change. We forget that all that needs to be done has been done by Christ. We take our frustration out on ourselves or each other. That is the drowsiness that our Lord speaks of. We grow sleepy. We give up the weight. And we forget the main show. We become just like the world. We sleep like the rest, not remembering our first love, Jesus. We make things here, retaining money, property, livelihood, communities, country, as that which matters. We are sick. The death is in our chests. We've contracted the deadly plague. We are all dying. One after another, we succumb to the ideas and ways of death. But today a message comes. The bridegroom is returning. I've never been at a wedding where the bridegroom is the center of attention. Our weddings here in this life, at least in our culture, are all focused on the bride. It is the bride who is robed in white. Every man who is getting married knows one phrase, whatever you want, dear, you want the purple flowers with the green sparkle? Sounds great. And yes, I like it very much, and I think it looks awesome. No groom chooses the cake or the flowers. His only job is to show up, smile, and not do anything that would ruin her day. But the Bible tells a different story. A story of a bridegroom and a cross of one who came to earth, and he died for fools. Did he do this for a nice bride, an attractive bride? Or did he do it for a bride who shouted insults? If you saved others, why can't you save me? If you really are the Christ, is suffering and death how you show your power? What a weak savior you are. Little did she see that for love's sake, he gave his last and dying breath for her. He did it. He adorned her. He made her worth it. He washed her by what he did. He made her radiantly beautiful by what he did. He did it for a bride who got it all wrong. He did it for a bride who loved many other things besides him. This is who he gave his life for, for you. He made her beautiful by what he did, and he poured out his goodness upon her. That's the capital bridegroom. Capital bridegroom with a B we're speaking about. Luther called it the blessed exchange. In marriage, the one gives the life to the other, and the other takes what the other has. The two become one flesh. But in the wedding of the cross, Jesus says, I will take all you are, and I will give you all that I am. Jesus takes our sin and ugliness and foulness. Jesus gives his righteousness and glorious innocence and dress, his sonship with the Father, his status and his life. We are beautiful. He has died, rose, and ascended. And he is coming back to get you. He's gone on a long journey. It's taking some time before the heavenly quarters are prepared. But he is returning. And as soon as he returns, the wedding feast of forever will begin. Our eyes now need to be ever drawn upward to that blessed day and event. Our problem is we put our life here. We are trying to make it when everything has already been done by Christ. 
We are trying to live, not saying that all we need has been done on the cross. We spend our lives trying to repair a world that will be destroyed by fire, seeking the approval of a world of imposters. Arise from your sleepiness, eyes awake. You are falling asleep in the long wait to this night of death. Awake the sense of longing for the one who has longed for you, the bridegroom of the soul comes. Will there be enough oil in your lamps when the abrupt cry wakes you up from the chill of night that the bridegroom has returned? Will you have enough oil or will it go out in the darkness, you being there alone and afraid? The purpose of this parable is not so that you justify all the ways in which you truly think that you have enough oil in your lamps, that unlike others, you have been wise and not foolish as you virginly keep your heart pure till Christ returns. That is never the point of Jesus' preaching, so that you can sit back and make yourself believe that you have done enough. For as many reasons as you can say, yes, I have been wise, we could show a million more how you have been unprepared, trusted in yourself, forgot the weight, thought of things here, made life here first priority, and have a thousand more loves in your heart than Christ dwelling in it. Jesus tells this parable to you today on the last Sunday of the church year so that you can repent with tears and so that you can go to the merchants and get some oil in the last hour while the shop is still open, while the merchants are still selling, until the shopkeeper turns over the sign in his window and locks the door. This is not a time to sit back and say, I have enough oil, but this is a time for those who are overprepared, for those who recognize that the wait is very long, who see their sinful flesh for what it is capable of, who believe that Satan is real and that the drowsiness of temptation comes near. This is not for those who say, let's not take too much oil and leave some for others. This is for those who take it all, who push and shove in line, and who attempt to buy out all the stock of the oil on the shelf. Yet today there is good news. There's a sale on oil. The price has just been reduced, paid for by the blood of Christ. Christ has purchased enough oil for you. That oil is free today. Yes, free, poured out by Christ upon you today, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, given without price, cost, or payment, at least for you, poured out on you very generously. That is the oil of God's Holy Spirit, the second person, the third person of the Holy Trinity that we worship and adore. That oil is the oil that produces faith through the hearing of God's word and the receiving of his gifts. The oil you need is not found in you. It is found outside of you as a gift of God to you. That oil is Christ's love poured out on you. So ask not if you have enough oil, but always seek more and never say you have enough. As the bride seeks the bridegroom, so... Awaken the wait. We should go to Holy Communion as we go to the day of our death. We should go to death as we go to Holy Communion. You probably didn't know what to think of that, but the answer is one little word that is a hallmark of the season. Go to death in communion with great joy. For it is there in both places that you meet your Maker and your Lord We can also then have great joy, even as we confess our sins and find nothing good in ourselves. We bring that to the Lord, and we lay it at his feet, and he takes it up, and he bestows on us his righteousness. His is our life, his is our light, and our salvation. On the day that Philip Nikolai heard of the death of one of his beloved students, a student that he had been hired to personally personally teach and tutor, he sat down and wrote the words of the first hymn that we sang as he thought of the young man, William, who had entered his eternal rest. He penned the words as the gravediggers did their work. Zion here, 
Zion hears the watchman singing, and all her heart with joy is springing. She wakes, she rises from her gloom. For her Lord comes down all glorious, the strong in grace, in truth victorious. Her star is risen, her light is come. Now come, thou blessed one, Lord Jesus, God's own Son. Hail, Hosanna. We enter all, the wedding hall, to eat the supper at thy call. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.